red button is good to go. Thank you very much, PJ. What a great job there. Am I, am I in the shop there? Yeah. I'm just talking to everyone there. They can, they're, they're probably saying yes, Ben, in the comments, <laughs> but uh, I won't read those comments, unfortunately, until later on. Don't forget to keep me in there. Don't let me out of there. If, I, if I'm out of there, you've got to use that thing to follow me, because otherwise they'll hear me talk and they can't see my face, <laughs> which would be a bad thing. Someone said to me once, this is back, it was when I was younger, they said, uh, you know, that, that saying, you, you, you've got a face for radio, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, a, a face for radio. Well, these days on radio, you, you can't have a face for radio because they just make such public events. They do that you need a relative pleasant face for radio and stuff. I said, because uh, because at, at the time I was a budding radio announcer at the time, and I said, what well, are you saying? Well, I haven't even got a face for radio on you. And he's like, um, he didn't say anything after that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't. I actually, actually, none of you guys will know this, but yes, I did. I had a radio show back in the early two, last early last decade, late last decade. I did on Canberra's One Way FM. It was a uh, Christian radio station. Talking all sorts of things, it was really interesting. Very interesting. It was. And it's still going strong, even today, in Canberra, they get like 50,000 listeners, I think they get, which is a huge number in Canberra, 50,000 listeners they do, and they talk all sorts of things. They've got folks on the family, work for today, uh, those kinds of things, and uh, and it's and, and it's and it's and basically they, they do a share of once a year, and that just provides the costs for the station every year. That does, and they always beat their costs. So it's uh, fantastic. That is praise the Lord. Let's pray as we uh, begin to hear the message. Uh, Lord God, we give thanks that, uh, you know, wonderful to hear, uh, you know, children out the back having a good time, and wonderful to hear your words spoken in this place and in Ocean Shores. Lord, we need it. We need your words spoken in Ocean Shores and beyond. In Jesus' name. And Lord God, I ask that. Uh, you know, ask you to die windy out the back as well, and all the kids there uh, pray that they'll have a wonderful time. And for all of us in here, Lord, that we too will hear your message, and we'll just and you'll encourage us by your word. Help us to see you more clearly in Jesus' name. Amen. This is actually a very, very good pack word for today because it's talking about our beliefs and behaviours. That is talking about talking about the mysteries of the church and talks about what it is and why it's here. But the church is the people. What about the people inside the church? How are they, how do they act? How do they behave? What's their belief supposed to be in this modern world that we're living in today? I don't think it would be wrong to say that modern culture is having a crisis of faith. I don't think it's wrong to say that at the moment. And, you know, whether or not you agree with you know, whether or not I mean, we look at the election results and whether or not you agree with us or not, I think it's just a reflection of the times we're in. It's just a reflection of the times that we're in today. And, uh, you know, last week we learned how the church is to interact with the world. How are we to interact with the world? So that's what we talked about last week. How do we interact? And each other. And today it's more about each other. That's the important thing. How do we interact with each other? What are our purposes are? Why it is there. We've learned the we've learned the why. Now we learn the how. So we've learned the why. Today it's all about the how. And I'm going to start by reading a passage from 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses uh, 14 uh, to 16. Now, now it's funny because I've got a brother called Timothy. And if you know my brother Timothy, you'll know that he's nothing like Timothy way, shape, and form in this uh, Bible story uh, that we're talking about. And uh, he is the first second generation Christian leader that we read about in the New Testament. Did you know that? He's the first. You might think, because you, you might think, uh, oh no, he's the first generation. Well, actually, he came to faith through another Christian. So he's actually the first second generation that we read about in the New Testament. The first generation, the ones that came to faith the apostles, they are the ones that came back from the apostles, they're the first generation. Now we're coming to the second generation, just <coughs> people like Timothy. 
And uh, we read about Timothy in the New Testament. He was a protege of Paul. Paul was the first generation Christian. He came to faith literally through Christ himself while he was uh, riding to Damascus. And now we come to Timothy, who was Paul's protege from there. Timothy at the time faced all sorts of pressures, conflicts, challenges from the church and the surrounding culture. Paul warned against false teachers. He encouraged Timothy to remain strong in the faith. Remain strong in the faith. And here's what he says. He says, although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you these instructions that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Uh, let's read on. Thanks, Keith. Just read on. The next slide. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh and was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on the world, was taken up in glory. So that's Jesus Christ. He appeared in flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by the angels, preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, and was taken up in glory. There's two things here uh, that we can learn from this passage. Number one, Paul refers to the church as God's household. That's what he refers to the church as. He refers to the church as God's household. Can you just, uh, whereas if you go to the previous slide, thanks, Keith. Let's go to the previous slide for a second. Let's go back to the previous slide. See, God's house, first good thing. If I'm delayed, you will know how people conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. So already we get an idea of how the church is meant to function. Paul is referring to it as God's household. That's what he's referring to it. So already he's referred to the church as God's household. Now, if Christ is the Son of God which means if he's the son of God, that means he is the heir of the church. He is the, he is basically, he is basically, what does the son do? He is the son of the living God. That means that everything that was given is his. Everything is his because he is the son. Now Christ the son of God then, which means that he is the head of the church because he is the Messiah. He's the head of the church. And we are therefore co heirs with Christ. Because through faith in Christ, our Lord, Saviour, and our King, we earn the right to become children of God. Children, like a son, have the right to be co heirs. We do. We are co heirs in Christ. If this is God's household, then we are, as the church, under the, the authority of Christ are in God's household. This tells me that this is our home. It's God's household. It's therefore our home. And if the church is our home, then the people in it are our family. The people in it are our family. Just a couple of chapters later, Paul instructs Timothy to refer to older men as though they are your own father. Talk to younger men as if you were talking to your brothers. Treat the older women as your mothers and the younger women as your sisters. He says that in chapter 5. You know, treat the older women as your mothers. Treat the older men as your fathers. Treat the younger men, the younger women, as your brothers and your sisters. So straight away, Paul gives us an idea of how the church is supposed to set up. Family. Treat older people as your parents. Treat younger people as your brother and your sister. Straight away, that's how we need to treat, that's how we need to treat one another. So the church of God is first and foremost a family. God is your father. You are part of not just any old family, but a royal family. Sons, daughters, prince, princess. 
of the high king of the universe. You don't get much more royal than God. He is the, he is the king of all kings. Mm -hmm. And as children of the living God, sons and daughters, with Christ as our with Christ as our Saviour, we too are part of this incredible royal family. So what does it mean for us? And how is the church supposed to operate? Well, it tells me that the church is not to function like a business or a government. Because how you treat a business or how you would treat the government is totally different how you treat your own family. Sure, sometimes families up in their business or work or government affairs get in the way of family, but it's not its, it's not its first role. Its first role is to function like a family. What's the evidence of a, ha of a healthy family? Well, the evidence of a healthy family is we see love, support, belonging, acceptance, protection. All those things is evidence of a, of a healthy family. Except this is not like any other family. This is not to function on merely a human on merely a human biological or temporal relationships. It's funny because how you operate your own family is different to a spiritual family. For example, a family is run like almost in a way we have biological relationships. You know, blood is thick than water, that kind of thing. But also temporal relationships. For example, you might lose relationships members of your own family because of a hurt or a lack of forgiveness that may have caused. This is something more deeper than that. This is divine, spiritual, eternal blood of Jesus. That's what this is. By which we have been adopted into a new family. I actually love in Vanuatu, I was in Vanuatu myself one day, about, when was I there? A long time ago, nearly 10 years ago, 9 or 10 years ago. I used to go travelling a lot. 9 or 10 years ago, I was in Vanuatu. And you know what I loved about some of the communities that we used to go to? It really was like a family. It was run like a family. And it wasn't like, and it, and it was spiritual. The church was the biggest building in the community. It was the church. It was, they'll come to the church. And, they, and, and, and their relationship was so much thicker than human relationships. It was spiritual. They really did love each other like a godly family. And we've been adopted into a new family. But families have ups and downs. They've got ups and downs. My brother, I'm picking on my brother today. I said he was not like Timothy. My brother and I were once playing cricket. How were we at the time? I think we were about eight or six, maybe. I think we were. I forget what happened, but one thing led to another. We were playing cricket, and then all of a sudden, a brawl occurred. He picked up the cricket bat and he threw it at me. He threw it at me. He missed me. I, I ducked and it hit the car and dipped it. <laughs> he did. Hit the car and dipped it. That was that was that was the example of a down moment in the family. I can tell you that much. My dad, my mum said to me, my mum was surprisingly calm. My dad asked, she said, your father's always seen for a couple of days. <laughs> That's what my mum said. She was surprisingly good about it, funnily enough. But my dad was not, was, was not good about it. He didn't want to see us for a couple of days. He didn't, he didn't actually see us for a couple of days. He was that mad about it. Uh, he was. There was another incident, there was another incident where uh, he showed his, his hockey stick. Right? And it was, but this, this, this was an accident. I went and had a look and he poked me on his stick. Gave me a fat lip. Yeah, he did. As I said, families have ups. Honestly, if you just, if you just had a look, you'd have to look at them. You'd have to put his the hook right in my face. <laughs> he didn't have to. He didn't play hockey. He just started playing hockey. I'm going to show you his hockey stick. He did. He did show me his hockey mask either. But anyway, show me his hockey stick. Families have ups and downs. But we always have each other's backs. And that is exactly how Christ wants to behave as his church. You might be thinking, well, my family's all screwed up. 
I don't want church to be anything like my family. Maybe you have a great family, but your relationships at church don't reflect family. Isn't that sad? That happens, you know. You have a great family, a loving family. They might want to be Christian for their loving family, but your church family doesn't reflect a loving family. Isn't that sad? When you know when you see that. But you see, the church is not temporal. The church is eternal. Your family in the church is eternal. We are an eternal family, and we're founded by the very God of this universe. If your relationships are not perfect, that is to be expected. Because what we have is a work in progress. Because this is not the finished product. You might think it's fantastic what we have here, but guess what? It's not the finished product. It's not the finished product. There's still, there's still more to grow. There's still more to learn about how a church family is supposed to operate. And our relationships are not going to be perfect. That's to be expected. Jesus himself promised that we would have trouble. But we are to take heart. For he has said that he, is, that he will overcome any troubles we might face. We are to love one another like a family. To overlook mistakes. Forgive quickly. Be loyal, not to gossip about our brothers and sisters. And remember, we have an older brother who's preparing a place for us in heaven. Jesus says that he has come, to his, he's off to go and prepare a place just for us. I saw a discussion, a debate. Ian would love this debate that I listened to, because I know, I know exactly what he think when uh, in this debate. A debate between two incredible people these i love listening to these two people because they're very passionate they're very firm about what they believe and they were talking about the afterlife it was between piers morgan and richard dawkins <laughs> it was between and you know what's really funny about this whole thing piers morgan was talking about was was talking about an afterlife it was fascinating piers morgan calls himself a believer in god whether what you see the fruit of his life, I don't know. Uh, but he was talking about how he believed in an afterlife. And he mentioned how in this afterlife, and he knows the Bible, it's quite interesting. He says, well, in the afterlife, hasn't he come to prepare a place for me? He's an Arsenal supporter. He meant, wouldn't that mean that, you know, I get to watch Arsenal play on the TV any time I like? I get to eat whatever food I like and not get fat and that kind of thing? A place just for me? And Richard Dawkins said, well, yes, well, wouldn't it be tedious after a while? But no, it wouldn't. He's come to prepare a place for us. He's preparing a place for us. And God is not bored. And for some of you, you might think, oh, how wonderful. A place just for me. What's it going to be like? I know in Deirdre, we have lots of dogs. <laughs> lots of dogs in there. Uh, if it was Deirdre and stuff, lots and lots of dogs. I know, I know that Dave would have, you know, a nice chair for to sit and have a cup. I know, it would be a place just for Dave. Parramatta would win. That sounds like hell for me. <laughs> that would be Parramatta winning. <laughs> no, that would be. But it's a place for us in heaven. It is. Where all of us will dwell in this place. I don't know what it will be like. I'm, I'm imagining, you know, imagine, I mean, imagine it being like, imagine it being like this incredible church. This wonderful church where we all gather to praise and worship. But we all have a place for the to. Kind of like a giant hotel in a way. Except the lobby is like really big. And you go and worship the Lord and then you go to your place, your little room that you're in. Not this wonderful hotel I'm thinking of. That's what I'm thinking of. But you know something? The church holds the secret to this. We hold the secret to this wonderful place that God's preparing us. The mystery of God. I thought the church has this mystery. It's this mystery of godliness. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the... Let me just, uh, let me just read that next slide again, thanks. Can you give me the next slide up, please? There we go. So I want to put the mystery again. That's, what the, that's the question the church holds. The mystery from which true godliness springs is great. And that is, he appeared in flesh, 
was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, and was preached among the nations. Was believed, well, so that's what it was, was vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. The church holds the secret of this mystery. We do this, we hold the secret of this mystery. Godliness springs through us. You see, we're the image of godliness in this world. Us. We hold the answer to that mystery. Us. Remember, all these mysteries we've been discussing, this is something that God is revealing. And that is, He's revealing true godliness in flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, preached among the nations, and it's Christ in us. Christ that we preach among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up to glory. I love talking about this because it's so wonderful. It gives me so much hope beyond what we can see. You know, one of the things you get to do as a pastor is be amongst people that are in the last years of their lives. The last years of their lives. And I talk to faithful believers that have no fear of dying. It's wonderful to know fear of dying. A lot of people, most people, fear death. I mean, fear public speaking over death. A lot of people do, but death's a close second. I think a lot of the things we've seen over the last few years is because they fear death. But I talk to people, wonderful, godly people, that have been faithful all their lives and have got no fear of death because they know that there's a place just for them being prepared. There it is. And you know what? It doesn't sound so bad. You want to know what their fear is? Their fear is their families. That's the only thing they're upset about. The only thing they're upset about is what they're leaving behind. Is that they're worried about their families. About how they're going to cope. But you know what? We don't want to worry. Because we can say to the Lord, I'm going to leave it in your hands, God. I'm going to leave it in your hands. And I know that you're going to take better care of them than I, than I ever will. You will take better care of them than I ever will. Because he is a he is a good father. He's a good father. And it talks about true godliness. Our behaviour and our beliefs are linked. If we act like we believe the gospel, then we act like we are members of God's family. In his household, we're fully active and we're alive in the world. Don't confuse... This is interesting, is it? Don't confuse godliness. It's very easy to confuse godliness. Because the focus should never be on our behaviour. People think of godliness, they think of our own behaviour. The truth is, godliness is nothing to do with our own behaviour. It's everything to do with the work of God that's in us. That's true godliness. Go so right there. Our belief that Christ, when we put who we put out there, will lead us to God Because you see, we can't do it on our own. We do it by trusting the work of the Lord that is in us. Let me conclude by reading this final passage, which is just on the screen. Thanks, Keith. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18 says, And we, which is all of us, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And that's and that's what and that's what we are. With unveiled faces, we are transformed the Lord's glory into His image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. It's kind of interesting. I don't know if you've ever been with someone who's dying in their last years, and you wouldn't think that verse applies because they're. You know, it's anything but increase in glory. You know, our body starts to decay. That's what happens when we start to enter into that final stage of death. But the glory of the Lord is not in our flesh, it's in our spirit. That's where our glory is. We look at the flesh. Man looks on the outside, but God looks on the heart. You know why man looks on the outside? Because man is too focused on the things of the flesh. That's why. They're too focused on material things. What looks like, you know, on temporal things. The flesh is temporal. How we look is temporal. I remember talking to this 
I remember talking to this, this, this incredible couple once. They'd been married for over 70 years. Mm. It's, it's not Prince Philip and Queen, there's another couple, that have been married 70 years. And how old they were told, never remember how old they were. And this lovely old man said, she's just as beautiful as the first day I met her. And the woman said, he must be going blind if he still thinks I'm beautiful. <laughs> but you know what? That's the spirit right there. That's the spirit there. It wasn't the fact that she looked as beautiful as she did the first day I met her. It was the fact that their love had grown. It had grown. It didn't matter how they looked. She was just as beautiful the first day he met her because she had grown all these years. All these years they'd grown more and more in love. I'm going to leave you on that. Let's pray. Lord, what a wonderful thing that we have in the Spirit of God that keeps us alive, that keeps us functioning, Lord. But, Lord, that helps us to grow. In the end of the day, it doesn't matter what we look like on the outside because we're not focused on these things. We're focused on things of the Spirit we are. And the Spirit helps us to grow and grow until we grow into ever-increasing glory in Jesus' name. And, Lord, for all of us today, I pray that... Uh, you will uh, hold us, keep us firm, grow us, guide us into true godliness. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you'd like any prayer, of course, make sure you come and see us as well. A morning tea here at the